Good day and welcome back to the 4080 podcast with your host as always, Mr. Thomas Henley. Today I've got a very, very special episode for you, indeed. We're going to be talking to none other than Paul from Autism from the Inside. Now, if you have been in the YouTube space, sort of watching videos on autism, uh, learning about autism through online content, you will have no doubt come across Paul's work in the past. I think he's, he's just gone around about just above 230,000 subscribers on YouTube, which is absolutely tremendous. And basically the, the background of how uh, me and Paul got in contact is I sent an email, I asked him to be on the podcast, of course. And the reason why is because we, we seem to share a lot of focus in terms of what we like to talk about, specifically um, around the topic of today's podcast, which is autism and emotions. Something that I'm sure uh, a lot of people have mixed mixed experiences with. Autism and emotions tend to be very, very um, complicated. And I, I know, especially when I was a lot younger, I used to think that emotions weren't really worth it. I didn't think that socializing and being around people and filling my own emotional needs was that important. Obviously, in adulthood, a little bit different. So, without rambling too much, Paul, how are you doing today? Yeah, not too bad. Um, thanks for accommodating the time difference. It's like first thing in the morning <laughs> for me, so hopefully my words are working. If not, they might take yeah. a little bit of time to warm up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, it's we do have quite a hefty time difference. It's actually about quarter past nine for me, and I think it's like quite early in the morning for you. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's like 11 hours or something. Yeah, yeah. And you're uh, tuning in from Australia. Yes. Uh, Whereabouts Melbourne. in Australia are you based? In in Melbourne, uh, down the southeast. Well, what is it What is it like to, to live in Australia? Because it's not one of the countries that I've, I've ever been to. It does vary quite a lot from city to city. Melbourne is a fairly big city like four or five million at least mm. um but one of the reasons i like it is because it has lots of sort of microcultures and like lots of sort of small niche groups going on mm -hmm. um, it's famous for sort of hidden bars in the city and hidden shops that you wouldn't know and unless you unless someone actually tells you about so that's very cool yeah Can't i find it I, on TripAdvisor. <laughs> No, you, you can't find the gems on TripAdvisor. No. There's, there's lots of good stuff on TripAdvisor, but... Cool, cool. So um, I suppose the, the, the best place to start is uh, your YouTube stuff. You know, obviously you've been doing absolutely tremendously well on YouTube and bringing a lot of um, awareness and understanding and education um, around autism. And what, what, what I really want to know is, like, what was your sort of starting story and you know what what was youtube like for you back then when compared to the stuff that you do now yeah so i was very hesitant before starting a youtube channel <laughs> do i really want my story to be public on the internet or not that was a really big sure. decision for me but I definitely felt like I wanted to share something, even though I didn't know what it was in the beginning necessarily. So it started off, I was just really excited to tell people about my autism discovery. And for me at the time, it was uh, obviously a big discovery and I mm -hmm. was coming to terms with the ways that I'd been masking and my, my coping yeah, strategies. Yeah, you're late diagnosed, aren't you? Yeah, so this was at the age of 30. Wow. So I wanted to tell people what I was discovering about myself. And part of the motivation for starting the YouTube channel at the time was that uh, the very first thing that I did was decide to shave my head for charity. 
so I, um, you can you can still see that all on YouTube with my, with my dreadlock story. So I had dreadlocks for fifteen years. Yeah, I do remember. <laughs> I do remember that. Cause I, I I think I came across your YouTube channel like quite a few years ago. It's like sometime during like my university days. I I was trying to do YouTube and stuff, but it was just like at the time it was just a little bit too much. I was studying biomed at, at University of Manchester and. It's very hard to kind of juggle things, juggle the taekwondo with the education and then do the YouTube. I was a little bit in over my head about it, to be honest, but I did come across uh, your videos along with, I think, stuff with Purple Ella, as well as I think a little bit from the Aspie world was the ma the main ones that I saw on YouTube at that, that kind of time, but... You did. You had the really cool dreadlocks and stuff. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. So awesome. as you can imagine, losing them after 15 years, I mean, it was literally half my life at that time. Oh my God. And the formative half of my life from ages 15 to, th for, to 30, you know, so yeah, big stuff. And I wanted to, wanted to share about it. The, the other main driver behind the name um, at the time, I, I started with the name Asperger's from the inside and only changed yes, it yeah. to autism from the inside sort of recently to ref reflect more of where I've gone since then and, and what I've learned. And when I was reading stuff about autism, it just didn't resonate very much. My, my kind mm. of uh, reaction to it was I can fully understand how it looks like this from the outside, <laughs> but <laughs> actually what's going on is something completely different. And another big part of my story is the book "Look Me in the Eye" uh, by John Elder Robinson. And there's a there's a moment in his book that's very very similar where he's he's describing what his psychologist wrote about him, something along the lines of you know, Johnny doesn't like to play with the other kids, <laughs> and and his adult reflection on that was something like Johnny would love to play with the other kids. All the other kids are really mean to Johnny. So Johnny's going <laughs> to yeah. sit in this corner and play by himself instead because he can't figure out how to do the whole social stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So huge difference between what we see on the outside and what we see on the inside. I think it's it's also as well like from sort of being quite a, you know, I've, on, I've had on the podcast like people from sort of different walks of life. Like I've had people in from like the autistic community um, I've had uh, like researchers and scientists, as well as some parents and sort of on the podcast. And there does seem to be different sort of cultures and ways of thinking about autism in each of these different circles. Like it's like even even to the point where things around language is very different. Like a lot of the sort of educational and how do you say, uh, parenting worlds, they, they, they seem to have a very big sort of focus on person first language because they have that sort of disconnect between like the child and, and their autism. Whereas you talk to someone, someone like, like myself, or you talk to someone within the autistic community and they're like, Oh, wait, well, it's, it's, it's part of me. Like, how can you separate that out? It'd be crazy. So it's, re it's really interesting sort of seeing the contrast with that. And, you know, the, th the thing about um, changing from Asperger's from the inside to autism from the inside, I think it's it's something that I, I've obviously done a lot of thinking about. And I think it's, you know, it's 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 a good consensus, I think, that most people prefer the the, the autism label. Yeah, it's a, it was a little bit hard to let go of the Asperger's label because I, I really strongly identified with it at the time. But I guess one of the main reasons for the shift, for my personal shift, which is probably very similar for others, is that it it's too neat and clean and it kind of implies that there are neat, clean, different categories and there really yeah. aren't. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, one of the things that I did on the YouTube channel um, a little while back was I did something that I started calling Aspie interviews. 
where I just, yes. when I meet someone, I just have a chat with them. I'd record it. I'd put it on, put it online. And I thought this is a fantastic way to, to get real people, mm. you know, on into the public eye so that you can see what autism looks like in real life. And as I was doing this with my friends, eventually I recognized, well, not all of them identify with that word Aspie yeah. at all. <laughs> and does that mean that I now don't share their part of the story because they're on, you know, in a different kind of category, like, but they're not, they didn't feel <laughs> like a different category. So yeah, it was just getting really confusing and the overlap was, yeah, getting confusing. And mm -hmm. I find that there, I was really surprised to find how much I can resonate um, with other people's stories, even if they didn't identify in exactly the same way mm -hmm. as I did. Because mm -hmm. uh, in, in the very first moment for me, I, I originally identified as an engineer and I attributed all of my characteristics to, well, I'm an engineer. Engineers are supposed to be <laughs> that type, logical. like an archetype of person, yeah. like these 16 personalities. Yeah. Have you ever done that test before? I have. And it keeps changing. Appar I did it again after COVID. Apparently I'm an extrovert now because I want to leave the house. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Would you like it's, to it's leave really the house? Weird. Yes. Well, you must be an extrovert. <laughs> it's really weird. Um, I used to be something like the thinker, something when I was a lot younger and like sort of going through life and, and sort of finding sort of passion and sort of meaning in understanding people, understanding emotions. Uh, I think over time, like my, 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 my personality has, has shifted quite a bit. I used to be very sort of, you know, logic is king, you know, emotions are just annoying. Uh, I used to very much have that, that sort of mentality about things. And, and now I'm more of the INFJ, like the, the advocate type, which I thought was really fitting. It, it always really surprises me just like how accurate those, that, that 16 personalities quiz can be. Um, it's not like a hundred percent, but it's, it's pretty, pr pretty spot on, um, in a lot of cases. Um, although I, I do sit very neatly in between introvert and extrovert. So, you know, if I factor in sort of a difference of my choice on some of the introvert, extrovert questions, I could be considered mm. a different one. So it's, 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 you know, it's interesting. Yeah, that's, that's definitely part of my story as well, because I thought my way into the emotions, mm. if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. Uh, and for a long time, I actually did a video on this on my emotional intelligence journey. And for a long time, I was sitting on the sidelines, watching people, trying to figure out <laughs> what was going on. Play and an algorithm I, to it. I had the like... <laughs> similar problem that I was talking about before, that from the outside, I couldn't really see what was going on because mm. all of the social stuff was happening on the inside that I, that I couldn't see. And so it wasn't until I got my dreadlocks and then suddenly found myself on the inside of all of these social groups that I sort of discovered that world through practice rather than through, through observation. So you, you dreadlocks were, were sort of a, an end to certain social groups. Yeah. That was part of my story is that after I got dreadlocks, how other people treated me changed radically overnight mm. all of a sudden i was being talked to and being invited to things and being included in things and i went from being boring shy and awkward to someone that people actually come up and talk to and interact with it's really weird how sort of modifications to your to your sort of outside appearance can sort of influence how people treat you it's like i i used to be treated very much as like a like a, a I used to be infantilized quite a lot when I was younger because I wasn't like I was I was quite sort of skinny I didn't really pay much attention to my fashion I didn't like you know my hair was just like overgrown and I, I just didn't pay much attention to it and now it's 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 really weird like 
like growing a beard, uh, putting muscle on. Like people, people very much have like different sort of reactions to you. So, and like I, I find that you know when I was younger, I used to have a lot of female friends, but now nowadays it's really, really difficult for some reason for me to make female friends. Whereas, you know, guys now nowadays will just come up to me and be like, you know, how's how's it going? And you know, hmm. I was at the gym the other day. I was like my head in sort of the way I can listen to my music. I've got these noise cancelling earbuds in and I was just going out there and I didn't want to talk to anyone. And then I had like a couple of people come up to me and I was just like, <laughs> just like please go away. <laughs> like I need to focus on um, getting through it. It was, yeah, it's, they can have some, some 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 changes and i think i think that's a really good sort of transition i guess to the topic of the podcast because mm. you know you know you've you've been on a, an emotional social journey uh, and i'd say that probably i have as well i guess what i want to ask is what aspects of autism do you think make it hard for us to meet our emotional needs that's a huge question. <laughs> there are quite a few aspects mm -hmm. of autism that makes it hard to meet our emotional needs. Let's go from the top down. Most sure. of the way that human beings meet their emotional needs is by socializing and by having strong social networks. Mm -hmm. So if for whatever reason you find it hard to do what everyone else around you is doing, uh, and have strong social connections, then it's mm -hmm. going to be difficult to meet those needs because it's hard to have a strong social network if you don't do the same things as, as the people around you. Mm -hmm. A great example of this is just if you, if you need something in, in terms of information or maybe I need help moving house or, I don't know, fixing a water system or something or some, something happens and I don't know how to deal with it, if I have a social network, then I'll ask one of my friends or I'll ask my family and they will say, oh, well, when that happened to me, I did this. And then, yeah, yeah. and oh, I'll, I'll put you in touch with the plumber that I used or something. And all of a sudden yeah. that problem is solved instantly through the passive help of the social network. And I didn't have to know where to go to find the help because I had this sort of supportive network around me. Hmm. So I suppose as well, like if, if you have that sort of social network around you, like a lot of the ways that a lot of, lot, you know, just observing other people, a lot of the ways that they seem to sort of process and get free emotions is by talking to people about them, you know, like having sort of like that outside in kind of view on it. I don't, I don't know a lot of there's there's not a lot of people that I know that can just kind of sit through and just sort their stuff out on their own without, you know, talking to other people. Well, that's how we're designed to sort this stuff out. It's mm -hmm. that's how human beings have coped for a very, very long time is in groups relying on each other. And so it's near on impossible to do that. <laughs> By yourself um, now in terms of what a successful like autistic social network will look like it does it, it's obviously going to look different but we still need to have some friends some social network some way to, mm -hmm. to tap mm -hmm. into those resources otherwise it's going to make everything really really hard so for I mean I've I hear a lot from people every once in a while things like making friends is too hard it's not worth the effort. I've, I'm just going to give up. Basically, I'm going to focus my energy on looking after myself because it's too hard to make friends. And that's a really <coughs> sad story because it doesn't normally end well. It is very, very difficult to get by without that mm -hmm. at all. I, I think, I think there's a, there's a really, you know, obviously, obviously, secondary school doesn't tend to be the most pleasant experience for a lot of, or high school, 
um, doesn't seem to be the most pleasant experience for a lot of autistic people. Um, but I found that, you know, that a lot of the systems that we have in place specifically in the UK are, are set up and surrounded, surrounding these uh, younger people, like, you know, early, early ages up to up until like late teens. The, the issues that, that seem to come up quite a lot is that transition from teenagehood to adulthood. You know, because when you go through sort of a school experience or, or, or around your parents, that those environments that you put in are, are sort of to a certain degree controlled. Like you mm-hmm. know that you're going to be around people during these these certain times. But if you go off to university, if you move out, you're in a, a whole different new place, and you, the responsibility for setting up social events and social times and and times to talk to people it's on you and like <laughs> you know for, for some people it's it, it can be really really difficult to sort of know where to go to find people to be friends with but also how to go about it do you do you do go up to, like for me for me i used to go up to people and say hey do you want to be friends so like <laughs> you yeah. know that very direct way of of making friends with people obviously it didn't work it was cringy but <laughs> i think that that time yeah. especially for me it was 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 a very difficult time and the stakes are a lot higher too i mean if you don't successfully make friends at high school no one's going to kick you out of home because you didn't make friends mm-hmm. at high school but mm-hmm. if you don't do the adequate social things at work and you don't form good relationships and you lose your job and you've got no money well Maybe if you don't pay your rent for a couple of months, they're gonna, you know, there's gonna be serious consequences for that. So sure, sure. So these these are just a couple of examples of where it, it might not be immediately obvious to everyone how emotions and emotional intelligence are absolutely crucial for these types of things. Things like making friends, things like keeping a job. Mm-hmm but it's all to do with managing relationships and managing relationships is the most complex thing that we do as human beings. Mm -hmm. So it relies on a few other emotional intelligence skills that not everyone has developed because we weren't taught how to, how to develop. Yeah. Like I said, the, the, the education system, the socialization is, is it's all geared towards people who are not like us. You know, and especially if you don't get picked up as autistic, I mean, you know, we could talk about the utility of of certain certain types of uh, autism education, but, you know, a lot of people don't get picked up and they sort of have to go through that, that experience and oftentimes learn things the hard way. And, you know, talking to a lot of um, autistic women, it also seems that that masking can be a really big roadblock because you know people can perhaps mimic learn and mirror different social skills and fit themselves neatly in into a specific social group that they want to be in but they don't really feel that that genuine connection that ability to share things that they love that ability to connect to people on a deeper level and show how they, how they really feel inside. That's a really good outside inside example. Again, Mm -hmm. the mimicking and camouflaging and things like that. You're doing all the things on the outside, but it's not being matched by what those things, how the other people are actually feeling. Mm -hmm. So I, I remember figuring out much later in life, probably my late twenties, the reason people dance is because they actually feel good when they're dancing. (laughs) <laughs> who knew how was i supposed to know that i just thought people did it because you were i don't i have no i had no idea to be honest <laughs> you just it's put the, it in a situation then you just it's yeah you know, it's, thought it's, you had to good. or it was something or i don't know <laughs> turns out people actually feel good in their body while they do that sometimes mm-hmm. it's the same thing with like wearing a suit and tie and having like a formal wedding and, and things like why do people do that turns out because a lot of people really enjoy that. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, that's why they, that's why they do it. And it turns out that I don't enjoy that. So just naming those things and recognizing that the reason for people's behavior is because it makes them feel good Mm. means that, well, when I'm looking for behavior that's going to work for me, it it needs to actually make me feel good as well. It's not just copying what everyone else is doing. Mm. You're not kind of sort of trying to neatly fit into these social norms of what's what 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 you're gonna enjoy, you know, you go out and you go to a go to a party or you go to like go to a club because that's what people do for fun on the weekend and everyone tells you that it's fun and uh, you drink alcohol and you do all of these these crazy things and that's that's fun. Not 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 for everybody. And and, and <laughs> especially when you're younger, like people don't really tell you that you don't actually have to do that if you don't want to. <laughs> like there's such a big culture in the, in the UK I don't know about about Australia but the, we have a really big sort of binge drinking culture in the UK Australia is um, pretty good at it, at its binge drinking culture <laughs> okay so we, you, a, you taught a little us well. bit similar <laughs> yeah I think I think for me like if if I, I wouldn't really understand if someone said said to me they do this because it feels good because usually the way that I would approach things is, does it make sense for me to do this alongside the other things that I'm doing? And, mm. and can I actually do this consistently on a regular basis? And then I, th- I think another, another really, really big thing for me, which comes up in a lot of my podcast episodes and the stuff that I do is uh, things around alexithymia. Like, I I really couldn't uh, connect enjoyable things that I do with me feeling good, me feeling Mm -hmm. happy. Mm -hmm. So I I always just felt like, you know, I I made a I made a video on on YouTube like I don't know like three or four years ago, which was called my split brain, where I I pretty much pretty much all of my early adulthood, late teens. I felt like there was like two different parts of me. There was like this uncontrollable monkey mind, like emotional ape brain that I just absolutely hated. And I had to feel like I put it in a cage all the time and keep it controlled. And then I had my logical brain, which was, in my mind, it was the best brain. It was, you know, it makes sense. You know, I don't want to do things that don't make sense. I don't want to do things that, that don't, aren't productive to me and i think that 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 disconnect between my emotions and the the actions and the the things that i did and the things that i thought really made it hard for me to understand how other people worked yeah i used to think they're just crazy beings they just run up run about and do stuff that makes them feel good it's like <laughs> I, like they scared me neurotypicals were really sort mm. of because they're to, emotionally based so rather sound. than logically based. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, yeah. Mm. it's yeah. It 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 led to me it led to me having a lot of thoughts of uh, superiority when I was uh, when I was younger. I was like, "Well, you're going and doing this stuff because you feel good. Well, I don't do that. You know, I'm <laughs> yeah. I'm a logical being. I'm an adult. I know what I'm doing, and." You know. Obviously, it's it's you know I had a lot of work to do in terms of integrating my emotional side, but and th- that exact that attitude is one of the reasons I started my emotional intelligence training course online, is because mm. I I noticed that attitude a lot. I noticed it in myself. I noticed it in my colleagues in in my engineering office. The one that basically put intellect and logic above emotions. And it's like, haven't haven't we kind of evolved out of emotions? Do we really need them anymore? And <laughs> actually, the answer the is yeah. the answer is yeah, we do actually. And mm-hmm. for anyone listening who uh, is thinking, yeah, but aren't isn't logic actually significantly better? I would recommend a book called Thinking Fast and Slow. It's a really good way to understand how we have two brains that do very different things. One of them is the logical brain and 
as you might um, be surprised to know, the logical brain is the slow brain. It is mm. incredibly painfully heavy and slow, and it does some things really well. But if you try and use it to do everyday tasks, you're going to run out of executive functioning resources and you're going to exactly. be overwhelmed yeah. by social situations and you're going to feel like there's a lot of anxiety and stress in your life because you don't have enough resources to do what everyone else seems to be doing really easily. And one mm -hmm. of the reasons for that is because we don't use the other part of our brain very effectively or efficiently. So when you start thinking about it like that, all of a sudden, it's not emotional intelligence, it's brain training. <laughs> yeah. I am training my emotional brain to do what I want it to do and serve me and it's like having a personal assistant or something where I just delegate all of the non-important tasks, the ones that can be done really quickly that don't need a super amount of precision, and they just all get done. Things like small talk, things like yeah. other social interactions and figuring out what I feel and things like that. Just the, the, the fast emotional brain does them in an instant without any effort whatsoever, without draining my intellectual capacity on mundane everyday things yeah so i, I mean like you know one of the things that really separates uh, us from animals is our ability to have that sort of higher cognition but it, it's it actually it does as as you said it requires a lot a lot, lot of energy like a lot of the reasons why we have things like routines and habits is so that we don't have to think about things that we just act like we just this is what we do and we do this and we feel this way and then we go and we feel that way and you know you need the bathroom you don't have to think hmm should i go to the bathroom you just go because mm. uh, it's it's like an emotional sort of habit kind of thingy yeah i think i think that's that's really worth highlighting to a lot of people because as you said i've i've heard that from a lot of people as well you know like whether it's from close friends um, whether people are doing it sort of cognitively like they actually you know actively trying to push emotions to the side or whether they just don't really think about that side of them and i think you know for for, for me that 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 alexithymia was 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 massive in in terms of sort of putting a, a blocker on my ability to 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 feel and to, to connect events with emotions and to to do all of that things and I, you know when i was younger i used to think i had multiple personalities you know i <laughs> because my outward you know i'd notice now and again and sort of bring myself back and sort of observe myself you know, for, for for your information now, it's it's different emotional states. But I thought I was having different personalities, and I labeled them with different colors. I was like, "Yeah, I'm feeling a bit red today," which will obviously I was just angry. But I thought that just be because my the way that I was talking and the way that I was behaving and the things that I was thinking about were so different, I was like, "I can't be the same person." Like, it's, <laughs> that, that disconnect was just crazy. And, and me not knowing much about autism, much about alexithymia, I was trying to do all these really crazy roundabout ways of, of understanding my environment from that sort of logical understanding. <laughs> it, was, it was a funny time. It was, let's say that. At least you were recognizing that you did feel differently. Mm. Sometimes one of the barriers for people, um, especially in, in the case of alexithymia, is I'm trying to check in with how I feel and I actually have no idea. <laughs> for me, I'm sometimes able to do that. Mm -hmm. It's kind of weird. I, I did a video on what I, I called it emotional damping because mm. I've got like, spring damping not equations well equations as well but like the the graphs and things from my mechanical engineering days and i'm like well my damping coefficient on my emotions is really high 
anyway so what basically what that's, that means it's <laughs> really int interesting you say because a lot of the ways that i try and explain alexify me to people who don't understand it you know like obviously like it's really useful in interpersonal relationships with like romantic partners and, and things of that nature like for me there's i i try and describe it like most people can tell when they're 20 percent angry or something they can sort of feel it they, they know that it's there they can see it in their behavior whereas for me it might be like 60 70 80 percent angry and by the time that it gets to that point it's overwhelming. It hits me all at once. I have a shutdown. I have a meltdown. I go off in a huff and, and have a paddy about it. But up until that point, it's, it's really just a feeling that something's not really good and my body feels a bit weird. Like, do you have that experience? I don't, I don't know if you have the experience sometimes of not realizing until later. So something yes, will happen yeah. and there'll be a mm. bit of a delay and it's almost like all of the sort of appropriate emotions, all of the things that I could have felt immediately, I feel nothing for the moment. And then a little bit later, it might be five minutes, it might be a day, it might be a year. <laughs> Suddenly they all hit me later on. Mm. And that is fantastically useful for dealing with crisis situations <laughs> because I don't get overwhelmed. <laughs> I'm I assuming still that's think sarcasm. Straight. No, no, no. It's actually really useful uh, because when something big happens, then I can stay focused and I can do what I need to do and I can make good decisions. Uh... And then it's not till later that all of the emotions come up and it gets overwhelming. Some people yeah. get scared or feel unsafe or something and they just lose their ability to think clearly. Whereas for me, I can usually keep my ability to, to stay conscious and think clearly a lot longer than, than most people. The downside is that it makes it harder to react instantly and emotionally and hmm. uh, in an appropriate kind of way. Yeah, which someone, in relationships, someone tells you, oh, my, my, da my dad's died. And you're like, yeah, exactly. Hmm. I'm like, uh, whereas in relationships, people need you to respond in the first quarter of a second <laughs> for them to feel like you care, for example. Yeah. Mm. So it, it can come up as a, as a challenge in relationships. I honestly, I've, I've never thought about the, the crisis situation thing. So I, I think there's been, you know, I'd say, I'd say there's been a few times in the past where that's been the case, you know, I kind of go into this, this weird sort of, I, I I get like sort of a bit zoned out, but I'm sort of fixed on like cognitively understanding what's going on and trying to get a solution. And then you're like, as you said, like, you know, I'll have a shower or something like a few hours later after this event, I'll just be like, oh my God, this is intense. And like, <laughs> you know, like breaking down, I'm, I'm going to cry. And, you know, it's, I th I think as well, it's, it can be hard interpersonally when when it comes to things like arguments as well, because any situation where you're sort of the 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 it's it's lim it any situation where emotions are heightened for for one person or for both parties, um, being able to really understand how that person's words or that person's emotions make you feel and then respond to that it's quite important to do that but you know a lot, a lot of the time it's it's not something that i can personally do so i i need like a you know an, an hour or two or i need like a couple of days where i can go i can go back i can really think about it write down my thoughts try and think about how i felt in that moment i feel yeah definitely like interpersonally especially in in sort of romantic relationships it can it can be hard to navigate especially when you don't know that it's there and that it's that mm. it's something that not everyone experiences and they don't understand it or they they choose to ignore it <laughs> like, 
And part of the goal of emotional intelligence training is to sort of reduce that lag time so Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. you're having a conversation and someone says something that you find inappropriate or offensive or something or, or, or they, you know, and instead of going or instead of saying, okay, and going along with it, and then the next day or the next week going, hang on a minute, I wasn't really happy there. You can yeah, say yeah. something in the moment and say, actually, how I feel at the moment is I would prefer not to go out to dinner right now. I actually am sure. a bit tired. I'm going to go home. Wow. And, and instead of it just helps making choices in the moment, it helps mm-hmm. with relationships in terms of standing up for your own boundaries of what you are happy and not happy with. Um, and also mm-hmm. it means that the other person gets instant feedback as to whether something, whether you find something good or bad. Because sure. if, if I tell someone, Hey, remember that thing you said last week? Well, I felt this way about <laughs> yeah, it. Like, what, what are you talking about? It, like? <laughs> it's a little bit, it's a little bit hard to, train you as my friend or my partner or something else right it's a little bit hard to train them if you're giving them feedback a week after the event whereas if they do something or say something and you're like oh that's the thing can you please not do that or say that because it has this effect on me Mm. so i suppose then they get the anxiety as well they're like all right they said they're okay They always do this, but they're not, and they're going to be waiting a week or so, and they're going to come back with this long paragraph of text, and Jesus Christ. Exactly. (laughs) And if you can say you're not okay when you're not okay, that actually builds a huge amount of trust in relationships Mm -hmm. because it means someone can ask me and they can trust my answer. When I say yes, they can trust that I mean yes, and when I say no, they can trust that I have a good reason and that I actually mean no as well. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah, but it it all comes down to tr- training how to do that uh, properly in the, in the moment in the relationship, sure. and that's what a lot of people have have trouble with. It's really interesting. I th- I think you know I think it would be it would be good to kind of go over some of the the things that sort of the practical ways that people can really understand their uh, their emotional side and sort of integrate it into their lives but i think another thing that we haven't touched on is the, the stuff around cognitive empathy because you know alexifying here it's related to us our, our emotional state and ability to communicate our emotions and categorize them whereas cognitive empathy or, or indirect communication be, being able to uh, look at someone, understand from their tonality, their body language changes, their facial expressions, that they're in a certain emotional state. It's it's important. It's an important part of reacting yeah. to it appropriately um, with adaptive empathy. So m- it helps to understand how most people do this and then why it doesn't work for you and what you need to do instead, if that makes sense. Yeah. So yeah. How most people do this is they start with the base assumption, the other person is just like me. Yeah. Which means yeah. if you're crying, it means you feel the same way as you do, as, as I do when I'm crying. Or it means if yeah. you are pacing around the room, it means that you feel the same way as I do when I'm pacing around the room. For most mm-hmm. autistic people, that is not a very good starting point. So we need to recognize that we probably need to check our own assumptions on that because it may Mm. be quite different. And then once we recognize that, we can start to uh, link up how the person is actually feeling with how I actually feel at another time. So Mm. the base emotions are all the same. When you're sad, it feels the same as when I'm sad. Now, you might express it differently. Different things might make you sad. but I, we still know what that base emotion is like. Mm-hmm. So it's like we need to do one extra step with the cognitive empathy to recognize the emotion that the other person is communicating, link that to an emotion that I know what it feels like, and then link that to a situation that and an expression that I would use to express that emotion. And then that way I'm translating from 
from their behavior to something completely different in my behavior that's essentially emotionally equivalent mm. and making those those cognitive a, links between yeah, the two right. it's a bit of a it's a bit of a uh, gymnastics mental gymnastics mm. but mm. it it is the way that we can make cognitive empathy uh, work really well and then once you try it like that feels like a lot of effort to go through but once yeah. you train it and you do it again 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 and you do it again, it becomes second nature mm -hmm. so that I can build up in my brain a database of how most people behave most of the time, which means it's like learning a second language. At the In the beginning, you're learning all this grammar and you're learning all these vocab and you're like, oh, how am I going to remember all of these things? But if you do it enough, our brain's you know, link up the patterns so that they're almost instantaneous. They go from our slow brain to our yep. fast brain. <laughs> and then suddenly we can do them all instantly uh, with the code switching that would otherwise mm -hmm. have taken us a long time. So the goal is not to keep doing those mental gymnastics. The goal is to train your fast brain to do it automatically so that it doesn't take you effort in the future. And there's a, there's yes, a big yeah. difference between those two objectives. I mean, it definitely sort of out in, out in the, the world, you know, with, with friends, coworkers, uh, you know, through, through podcasting and stuff. I think when I'm mentally quite, I have, I have quite, a, you know, my mental energy, I feel quite good. I think that those, those are the times where I'm, a lot better at picking up on emotional cues like that. I think that the, the issue for me particularly comes in when I'm feeling comfortable or that I'm around people that I'm around around a lot. I kind of I kind of shut my brain off a little bit and I think some sometimes I, I, you can get yourself into a bit of a situation where you get paranoid about, oh, are you are you thinking about this in the right way? Are you are you exaggerating how they might be feeling? And I I think, you know, to a certain extent, that that's really sort of a useful way of sort of navigating the world from from our perspective. But I also think, especially if you're in a relationship with um, a neurotypical individual that they they can do a lot of of stuff themselves as well because you know there there will be times where you don't pick up on the fact that their tone's just a little bit different than usual you know because pe people vary how they speak and and how they they look and feel on a daily basis and it's not always connected to a certain emotion so I you know I th I think. It's it's kind of like meeting them halfway with it because I, I think that something that really helps me feel a lot more confident that I understand the situation is if they they tell me, mm. you know, I say I, I pick up on something that's maybe a bit different. I say, "Are you okay?" Mm. And instead of going, "Yeah, I'm good," they'll say, "No, I'm I'm not mm. I'm not good." Or they, you know, they'll, they'll say, "Yeah, I'm good." I'm like, "Are you, are you sure?" Like, <laughs> that's a, that's actually a really fantastic simple strategy mm -hmm. that I that I teach people in the, in my emotional intelligence course. It's around guessing and just noticing. Like even if you don't know what the right answer is, you've noticed something is here. So you say, "Yeah, yeah. I noticed that. something. Is everything okay?" And they'll say yes, and you'll say. Okay, because the reason I'm asking you is because it doesn't sound like you're okay. And <laughs> and then yeah. it might take one or two goes, but you'll eventually they'll eventually help you to figure out what was the thing you noticed. Because what you're noticing is there's a mismatch. Someone's saying yeah. they're okay, but they're sounding like they're not okay. And it's hard to figure out which one is correct, but that, that's the hard part that mm. you that we want to get better at over time. Some people it can feel really like someone's lying to them as well mm. like you know if you if you're very sort of hyper fixated on direct communication exactly, and you yeah. don't really go with the indirect stuff if someone says they're okay you'd be like cool and you just get on with stuff so it's like the, and, so then, it's, and if they say they're okay but they're not 
you're like, well, why the hell? Why the hell did you lie to me about it then? Like, so you get the, the issues around that. Yeah. So, so even just mentioning it is a really good is a really good strategy. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. But what I was going to say before, just very quickly, we'll probably have to wrap up. Sure. Sure. Is that? Yeah. It's this kind of stuff works both ways as well. So in my coaching work, I work a lot with partners of autistic people, mm-hmm. and. Uh, a big part of that is helping them to train their brain to recognize when I come up to you and tell you in a calm voice that I'm at about 95% of my capacity and I'm going to need to go home pretty soon. Yes. They need to recognize that that means I'm actually at 95% of my capacity. I'm yeah, just because down you're, and you better do something really quickly and... because it's really <laughs> urgent and I know I'm not really expressing that through my emotions or words or speed of voice mm. or emotional tone or anything at the moment, but that's because I'm trying not to get tip myself over the edge. So they can also help with that, with bridging that gap as well. Mm. And there's there's obviously a lot of different sort of gaps and and ways of bridging communication between autistic people and neurotypicals. I think it's 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 also you know really important, especially when it comes to mental health settings. You know, if if some if someone has a uh, patient, they're a psychologist, they're a mental health worker, and they're, they're autistic, and the mental health worker doesn't really know much about autism. And that person comes up and says, I'm having the worst time. I am just mm. completely depressed all of the time. And the fact that they're not breaking down and sobbing and crying in front of them, they don't really take it seriously. And I think, you know, there can be lots of situations like that, whether it's at school or in the workplace. Yeah. Um, you know, Medical's a good statistics. example of people mm-hmm. being like sent home from hospital, come back when it's worse. Like I wouldn't be in emergency <laughs> if it wasn't worse. This is like 10 out of 10. What do we, what do we yeah. do about it? Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, the, the risk of the rambling a bit more, I think it's uh, been really good to, to sit down with you and it's, um, it's really nice to be able to, to talk to you about sort of emotions and autism and, you know, I, I I really value a lot of the work that you've done, and obviously your your YouTube videos. Uh, where can people find you? So look up autism from the inside. Um, you'll find me on YouTube. That's probably the first thing that'll come up. Um, I've also got a website, autismfromtheinside.com.au. Mm-hmm. Um, I do, do coaching, one on, don't you? One-on-one coaching. So that's mostly for autistic adults. Um, sometimes parents uh, need help um, working through a situation uh, or the other, the other big one is relationship coaching. Uh, if your sure. partner is autistic and you're going to need some help navigating that and understanding their needs and common patterns and things, there's some really common patterns that I see all the time in that. And yeah, emotional intelligence, training, um, public speaking, various different advocacy things and training. And yeah, you'll find it all on the website. Sure. Uh, And I will put the website link down in the comments. So uh, thank you very much for that, Paul. It's, It's been really lovely to chat to you. And of course, if you have, talking to you guys, if you have enjoyed this episode, uh, whether you're on YouTube, hit that subscribe button, of course, give it a like. Uh, if you're on Spotify, Apple, all of that stuff, uh, give me a rating. Even if it's just um, a star rating and no text, that is completely great. Better than nothing. And if you want to keep up to date with my life, some of the blogs, um, or you want to check out the the videos that I make and the reels, you can find a lot of my stuff over on my Instagram page, Thomas Henley UK. And if you want to get in contact about uh, anything to do with um, coaching, something that I'm <laughs> that I'm going to do at some point, uh, going to set up my new business in April. Very excited about it. Or public speaking, or modelling, anything like that. Getting get in touch with me through uh, my website thomashenley.co.uk. And with that, yeah, thank you very much for listening. How have you enjoyed? the 40 or experience, Paul. (laughs) 
Yeah, good. Um, thanks, Thomas, for inviting me. Um, and I'm not sure exactly when this is going to be uh, broadcast live, but another exciting piece of news is that I'll be in the UK in yes. July this year. So I may see some people there during that time. So stay in touch for details about that. Awesome stuff. So thank you very much for listening, and I will see you all in another episode of the 4040 podcast. See you later, guys.